Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. The music you just heard was created on my Emu Morpheus Z Plane synthesizer. I picked one up on the advice of Tim Gregory, who, along with Laura Sadal, formed the goth electronic duo Collaborator, who I must have seen live at least a couple dozen times when I was in graduate school at Washington University in St. Louis. And indeed, the Z plane that's mentioned in the Emu Morpheus manual is the Z plane that we've been talking about in EC 2026 Introduction to Signal Processing. In the last lecture, we talked about how the system function, aka transfer function, which is the Z transform of the impulse response, relates to the frequency response. But our examples were all first order systems with a pole restricted to be on the real axis. So we could use that pole to create a low pass or a high pass effect, but not a band pass effect. In this lecture, we'll see that by moving from first order to second order IIR filters, we can create resonant bandpass filters. So now, in addition to including the previous output, we'll include the output before that. In this particular example, we have three feed forward coefficients, but that could vary. The main thing is that I now have a quadratic polynomial in the denominator of the transfer function. So I now have two poles, and assuming that our impulse response is real valued, both of those are either real or they're complex conjugate pairs. And that's the more interesting case. So to figure out the roots, it's convenient to multiply the numerator and the denominator by z squared. So we get rid of the negative powers of z. And then we can just apply the old fashioned quadratic equation. And I should mention that this business about your roots either being real or occurring in complex conjugate pairs for real valued impulse responses that extends to higher order systems than an order of two. Now, I've previously mentioned that you need to be able to go back and forth between this form on the right that consists of factors with the poles and zeros explicitly written, and the form on the left where those factors are multiplied out and you have a polynomial that you can directly relate to a difference equation implementation. But I wanted to mention that if you had, say, an eighth order filter, you might not implement it like this directly. You might implement it as a cascade of four second order filters. It depends on the situation. So let's talk about those poles. If I think about their locations in polar form, well, we'll typically want our poles to have a magnitude that's less than one, so they're inside the unit circle, so our filter is stable. But let's pretend for a second that our poles are real. This will give you some sort of decaying impulse response, typically. But with the poles being complex, we wind up with this decaying exponential term being multiplied by a complex exponential. So that will give our impulse responses some weakly characteristics that we'll call resonance. And we'll see that if you put the pole close to the unit circle, you can make a bandpass filter. Now, seeing resonance in the time domain does not guarantee you'll see a resonant peak in the frequency response. If you have a couple of poles that aren't too close to the unit circle and they're pretty close to the real axis, you might just get a monotonic high pass or low pass response. When thinking about the effect of poles and zeros on the frequency response, we can imagine crawling along the unit circle we look to see if there are any poles or zeros near us. In the case of this point over here, which would correspond to a high frequency, we have zeros that are near us. This zero is particularly near us, and that will tend to pull down the magnitude of the frequency response. There are some poles that will tend to pull up the frequency response, but they're far away. Over here, on the other hand, at this lower frequency, the zeros are further away, but I have this pole sitting here that's quite close to me. So that's going to pull up the frequency response there. Here's an example of a filter with two poles that are at angles of two pi over three and minus two pi over three. And these are very close to the unit circle. So moving around the unit circle, we see that there's going to be this big peak near two pi over three, 
which you see here. Now remember, at any given point, all of the poles and zeros affect the response. It's just that something that's closer to you will have more in effect. So when we're sitting here at omega hat equals 2 pi over 3, this pull down here also has an effect. The net effect of all of that is that this peak isn't going to be exactly at 2 pi over 3, but because this pole is so close to the unit circle, it's going to have a dominant effect, and the peak is going to be very, 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 very close to 2 pi over 3. There's a movie related to this particular example on the DSP First website. Let's click on IIR filters, scroll down a little bit. Ah, here's the Z to Frank movie. And this is that exact example. You see that the magnitude of the pole they set is 0.97, and we're setting the angle at 2 pi over 3. So if we scroll down a little bit, there's this nice movie that they made. Let's check that out. So as the purple line moves around, you can see it tracing out the corresponding point on the frequency response. That's kind of fun. Here's another example. We have a zero at minus 0.45, and we have poles at 0.9 e to the plus minus j 2 pi over 3. Now to figure out what the impulse response looks like, it's helpful to write this system function as two first-order systems in parallel, where each of the systems now has a complex-valued impulse response. And I can figure out each of the individual impulse responses and then just add them together. Our tool for doing this is a partial fraction expansion. To figure out the partial fraction expansion coefficients a and b, Let's think about multiplying both sides of this equation by the factored form of this denominator. So this winds up canceling on the left here, leaving me with just this polynomial here on the left. And then when I multiply through by the factored form on the right, this factor winds up getting canceled, and I'm left with this factor appearing here. Similarly, this factor winds up getting canceled, and I'm left with this factor appearing here. Now, one way to find a and b is to write two equations. One equation where we group all of the constants on either side, and another equation where we group all of the coefficients in front of z to the minus 1 on either side. And then you can solve that 2 by 2 set of equations for a and b. Another approach is to say, well, this equation needs to hold true for whatever we plug in for z. And there's some particular values of z, namely the actual pole locations, that will drastically simplify this equation. For instance, let's plug in the pole z equals 0.9 e to the minus j 2 pi over 3. So plugging that in on the left-hand side gives me this. But notice, when I plug the pole in here, this whole term here winds up going away. So this isn't here, and now I can easily solve for b. Here b equals 0.5. Actually, it's not so easy to find b. You take this and divide it by this, but then you have to do some manipulations to wind up simplifying it to 1 half. I'll leave that as an exercise for the viewer. Similarly, I can plug in the pole 0.9e to the plus j, 2 pi over 3, and then when we plug that in, this term here goes away, and we can solve for a. This trick of plugging in the poles is referred to as the residue method. Given the way it winds up working mechanically in cases like this, it's often called the cover-up method. Now that I have it written in these forms, we can use this line from our Z transform table. For the first term, we'll plug in 0.9 e to the j 2 pi over 3 for a, and wind up with this impulse response for that first term. And for the second term, we're plugging in 0.9 e to the minus j 2 pi over 3 for a, and we wind up with this impulse response for our second term. 
Now we're imagining these as systems in parallel. So, adding those impulse responses together, oh look, I have e to the plus j something and e to the minus j something. So that should automatically make you think of the inverse Euler's formula for the cosine function. Now, remember that when you apply that formula, you need to multiply by 2, so this 0.5 goes away. So we have a decaying cosine that starts at n equals 0. The frequency of the cosine, 2 pi over 3, corresponds to the angle of our poles. And the rate of decay is controlled by the magnitude of our poles, with higher magnitudes corresponding to slower decay. Oh, and I should mention that my interpretation of it as a decay only makes sense because this magnitude is less than 1. If the magnitude was greater than 1, we would have exponential growth. And if it was equal to 1, well, we wouldn't have this here, and we would just have an instant on cosine. So this system function, which has this pole zero plot, oh, I think I forgot to mention, when we multiply the numerator and the denominator by z squared, in addition to this zero at minus 0.45 I mentioned earlier, we also have a zero at the origin, although that zero is not very interesting. We found this impulse response, and don't let the red line in this plot fool you. The actual discrete time signal h of n is shown in the blue stem plot. The red represents the sort of thing that would come out of a digital to analog conversion system, and is just meant to illustrate the underlying sinusoidal structure. The underlying cosine has a period of 3, but we're putting period in quotes here because, of course, this signal is not actually periodic. It has this decaying envelope created by the 0.9 to the n factor. We refer to this kind of decaying oscillation as a damped oscillation. Now, instead of working through this example with the specific values of 0.45, 0.9 and 0.81, you can work through it in terms of some generic variables and wind up adding this to our z-transform table. I won't work through the details here. You can take this on faith. You can also take on faith this more general pair that includes this phase term in the cosine. Notice that if you plug in 0 for the phase term, this more complicated formula reduces to this simpler formula. So now that we have these pairs, we don't have to go through all that effort of slogging through the partial fraction expansions. First notice that this system function that we're about to invert is not the same as the one we just looked at. That one had a plus here. This one has a minus. We can look at the form of the transform and match up r squared with this coefficient in front of z to the minus 2, and then taking the square root of that, gives us the r of 0.9. And then we can take this 2r cosine theta term here and match that up with 0.9. That gives us an r cosine theta of 0.45. And notice we've already found r, so we can plug r in here. And we see we need cosine theta equals 1 half. And taking the r cosine of 1 half gives us pi over 3. So we now have the r and theta we need to plug into the impulse response formula here. So we previously looked at an example where the underlying cosine had a frequency of 2 pi over 3. Here we have a frequency that's half that. It's just pi over 3. So now we have a wave where the underlying sinusoid has a period of 6, which is twice of what it was in the previous example. And because we have a minus here, instead of the plus we had earlier, the zero here is now at 0.45 instead of minus 0.45. And if we look at the frequency response plot, we see that at the frequency of pi over 3, the pole is closer than anything else, so that's going to dominate the response. Now the zero here isn't really going to have a particular frequency-dependent effect because it's equally distant from all the points on the unit circle. But this zero is going to have a tiny effect, and this pole is going to have a tiny effect. So the peak isn't going to be exactly at pi over 3, but for all intents and purposes, you can call it close enough, because this pole is so close to the unit circle. Now, let's half the frequency again, 
So we have a frequency of pi over 6. And let's change this 0.9 to 0.95. So the envelope decays a little slower. Anyway, this is what that impulse response looks like. The underlying cosine now has a period of 12. If I plug these numbers into the formula in our Z transform table, we wind up with these numbers. And the pole zero plot looks something like this. So the zero has scooched out here, and it's going to play a role near DC. It's going to want to pull the magnitude down there. But if we're at a frequency of around pi over 6, this pole is going to be dominant. So the frequency response looks like this, and we see that we're going to have a preference for frequencies near pi over 6. Again, the peak won't be exactly at pi over 6, but you could call it close enough. Before wrapping up this discussion, let's talk about how you might explore this in MATLAB. If you have this system function that corresponds to this difference equation, and we can implement it in MATLAB in the following way. Here we're defining the filter coefficients a and b in terms of the way they appear in the polynomials that form the ratio of the z transform. To compute an impulse response, this particular code is creating a set of values for the variable nn that go between minus 2 and 19. And this particular code here creates an array of the same length, but all of the values are going to be 0, except for the one corresponding to nn equals 0. So if we filter that impulse using these coefficients, that will give us an impulse response. Now, of course, the real impulse response is infinitely long, but this will give us part of it that we can plot. And then using this frequency command will give us the frequency response computed on a dense grid. Oh, one final note. The emu morpheus I mentioned at the beginning has seven two-pole resonant filters for each voice. So that's a total of 14 poles. And the Morpheus has 32 voices. That's a whole lot of DSP for 1993. The original Emu Morpheus is long out of production, but Rasa Electro Music now provides that kind of experience in the form of a Eurorack module.